Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good to see you. Yes, if you would go ahead and type your name into chat for me. As usual. Thank you very much. Good to see everybody. Ooh, it's gonna be a hot day today. We are in for a little bit of a heat wave this week. I uh, returned back home last night. I wanna thank everyone for your uh, patience um, with the outstanding assignments. Um, Hopefully you saw my message on Friday, letting you know that I had to leave town. Uh, I had a death in my family and I had to leave town to attend the services. Um, I will be doing all that grading uh, today and tomorrow. And um, by the time I see you on Wednesday, um, those grades will all be entered for you. So we'll be all caught up by then. And I, again, I wanna thank you for your, um, for your patience. I really appreciate that. So it looks like everybody's here, which is great. Um, today, we are going to be doing an exercise in a very common procedure called gram staining. So we're gonna be talking about how we perform this um, staining procedure and why we do it, um, what it's used for, how it helps us in this process of identifying microbes, which is something that we do every day in diagnostic laboratories uh, in the healthcare setting. So before we jump into that, um, I'm going to pull up our schedule as usual, just so we can see uh, what we're coming into this week, what kind of um, lecture topics and so on we will be looking at this week. So I'm just pulling up our Canvas page. That's what you should be seeing at the top of your screen right now or on your screen right now. So we're in week three now, the week of June 7th. Here's our to-do list for the week. You have two lecture topics this week to view on our playlist and two lecture quizzes. Um, we're back on to the Wednesday and Friday due times um, for those quizzes. We're gonna be looking at prokaryotic cells in more detail. Uh, we're essentially jumping off from that lecture about the cell and we're talking in a little more detail specifically about prokaryotic cells. And then the second lecture topic for the week will be about eukaryotic cells. So remember the terminology can be a little confusing sometimes, but there are three domains of living things, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. The first two domains are prokaryotes. So bacteria and archaea are prokaryotic. And what that means to us is they are single celled organisms and they have no internal membrane bound organelles. So no nucleus, no mitochondria, no Golgi apparatus, nothing like that. They have DNA, because all cells have DNA, but it's not enclosed in a compartment. It's not enclosed in a nucleus. Um, eukaryotic cells, of course, are very different. Eukaryotic cells do have those internal compartments. They do have organelles. Eukaryotes also have what we call a cytoskeleton, a true cytoskeleton. So just different categories of organisms. The bacteria and the archaea are the prokaryotes and all of the eukarya are eukaryotes. So those are gonna be our topics in lecture for the week. 
Today, of course, in lab, we're doing gram staining, as I said. And on Wednesday, when we get together, we're going to be talking through some very practical techniques that we use. Regardless of what testing procedure we're doing, we use a whole series of techniques that we refer to as aseptic technique. And those are the things that we do in the lab every day regarding um, how we work that will help us keep our cultures safe from us and keep us safe from our cultures. And of course, as usual, there will be a lab homework assignment this week for you to complete and submit by Sunday. So that's what we have coming up this week. Um, the other thing I wanted to just talk about very briefly this morning is just a little clip of a story um, that I saw in the news that actually directly relates to some of the things we've been talking about regarding cells and cell structure. I'm gonna go ahead and pull it up for us. If you'll give me just a moment. This story just popped up as sort of a quick little story on the news. Okay, here we go. Let me see if I can do this for us. Share my screen. All right, let me do that one more time just to sort of make sure. Okay. So how many of you have heard that there is a cicada event going on, not here where we live, but um, a little bit to the west of us, sort of in the northwest region of, no, not northwest, I'll say the central, north central region of the country. A brood of cicada is emerging this spring and summer. Um, and if you're not familiar with cicada, these are organisms that literally burrow down into the earth and they have a life cycle of about 17 years underneath the soil. And then they emerge again every 17 years, they mate and then they go back under the soil. So when they emerge, it's quite an event because hundreds and thousands of them come up out of the soil. You've probably heard the terrific sort of singing noise that cicadas make when they are around. It's sort of a, one of those iconic sounds of summer, cicada singing. So apparently, apparently some folks decided that it might be fun to cook up these cicada. <laughs> um, it is becoming more common now for people to eat insects. People around the world have been eating insects for a long time. But um, people don't generally eat a lot of insects in this country, but some chefs around, uh, around different places in the country have decided to add cicada to the menu, uh, cooked of course. Um, and the FDA put out a little bit of a warning for us, don't eat cicada if you are allergic to shellfish. So that seems kind of strange. People are wondering, well, gosh, why, where's the connection? Why, if I, if I can't eat shellfish because I'm allergic to them, how in the world does that relate to eating cicada? And of course the answer is the carbohydrate, the carbohydrate that surrounds shellfish and surrounds the cicada's body, the, the exoskeleton in both of those types of organisms has the same carbohydrate in it. Does anybody remember? Does anybody remember the name of the carbohydrate that makes the exoskeleton of insects and shellfish? It's a polysaccharide. It's quite unusual. You can also find it in certain fungi. Very good, Elaine. Elaine's got it. Very good, Carrie. And John, it's chitin. Chitin is a, one of those big, massive polysaccharides and um, chitin is not found in our body. So chitin would be a foreign material to us. And while most of us have an immune system that will just leave chitin alone, um, some people are allergic to chitin. 
And if you uh, have, a, have that allergy, anything that has chitin in it is going to set you off. So, um, so yeah, that's the connection. The connection is that exoskeleton. Um, and I've, I've never eaten cicada, <laughs> I can say, uh, with some assurity. Um, but um, it would certainly give that uh, insect a bit of crunch um, <laughs> after you cooked it. Um, the chitin is a, a very um, strong, uh, very crunchy kind of molecule. It's the reason that when you step on an insect, it crunches under your foot. That's the chitin. Yeah, Connie. Uh, Connie's talking about how most of the world um, uses insects as a food source, and it's it's a good food source. It's a source of protein, and it's quite plentiful. Um, depending on the insect, it can also be a source of certain fats um, that are necessary in the diet that might be hard for some people to get from other sources. So we are the unique ones. We're the minority here in not eating insects. Um, and there is a real sort of a push in culinary circles um, for Americans to get over that and try to, you know, um, at least try some dishes that have insects as an ingredient, um, crickets and, um, uh, again, cicada and um, certain kinds of spiders. And it seems very um, strange to us, but the rest of the world has been doing it for quite some time. And it would certainly be a more sustainable way um, for us to get protein moving into the future. Yeah, Lacey, it, it, Lacey's talking about how um, she recalls um, cicadas being around every summer. And the, the thing that gets confusing with cicada is that there are, we call them broods. There are populations of cicada that um, emerge every 17 years, but there are lots of broods. So you can get cicada emerging close to every summer, but they're all different broods. In other words, brood A comes out this year and then goes back underground for 17 years. Next year, you might get brood B coming up and then it will go away for 17 years. Um, the brood that's up right now is called brood X. And again, it's uh, more towards the central part of the country where that brood uh, lives, where it um, goes underground and stays. They're a fascinating organism, you have to admit. Um, very, very fascinating that they have that long stretch of time under the ground and then they emerge and they make such a presence, they, they molt almost immediately. They leave their little empty shells um, attached to tree trunks and, and wooden fences and things like that. And, um, and they make quite a racket in the summer because they're trying to attract a mate. That's why they're emerging. They're emerging for reproduction and um, and they're singing, they're singing uh, to try to find a mate. <laughs> Connie saying that she's seen some crazy pictures, <laughs> some crazy pictures of them. Oh, when in sometimes in certain locations, all of a sudden, like hundreds and hundreds of them will appear. And um, some people find it, you know, great and exciting and other people are so grossed out by it they just can't bear it they can't bear the bugs everywhere um they really aren't um in terms of insects they really aren't a a, a, a harmful insect in any way they're not gonna bite you um, but they are pretty large you know they're pretty large and they have big wings and i think that kind of sets some people off so yeah, it's, um, yeah, Lacey, I, I remember as a child finding their shells all the time. I remember, you know, if you put your hand up against a tree trunk, um, you know, you might hit one of the shells and it would just crunch in your hand because it's empty. It's what's left behind when the insect molts, when it comes out of the ground. And, but it looks almost like an intact organism. It's a perfect little shell of the organism. Again, made out of chitin. Um, and you find them everywhere. 
after they emerge. Yeah, Elaine's talking about um, remembering cicadas in Tennessee. Yep. And, and we do have broods here in New England. We do have at least one brood here in New England. Um, but that's not the brood that um, has emerged this summer. Nature is definitely brutal. Very brutal. Insects are some of the most brutal organisms there are. They are, it is, you know, kill or be killed in the insect world. That's exactly right. Um, Stephanie's asking about the protein content in insects. So certainly you would have to consume a lot of insects to get the amount of protein that you would get in say a chicken breast or um, a hamburger or a can of tuna fish. You would have to consume a lot of them. Um, but because they're so plentiful um, in certain parts of the world, it's just a regular part of their diet. Um, this is one that surprises me. Um, in parts of Asia, um, in particularly rural parts of uh, Southeast Asia, um, tarantulas are a big part of their diet. And uh, women will literally go out into the woods and collect tarantulas each day, um, which sounds terrifying to me, but they place uh, baskets down on the ground underneath trees, and then they beat at the branches of the tree with a broom or a stick and tarantulas fall. It's kind of a nightmare, a nightmare scenario for me. Um, they catch them in these baskets, they bring them home and they cook them up. It, it's like they're going out to the garden you know, to pick some fresh lettuce or pick a tomato. They're going to get some tarantulas um, to have for dinner. Um, and again, you know, um, not a bad source of uh, nutrients in the diet, um, just not something that we're accustomed to. <laughs> Jen saying, nope, no, 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 no. <laughs> I don't even think I could eat um, a cooked tarantula. I don't think I could do it, but I certainly, could not go out into the woods and harvest them. <laughs> that would not be something I could manage. <laughs> oh gosh. Yeah, so interesting stories all the time um, in the news. All right. So um, before I jump into our uh, lab exercise today, I will ask if anybody has anything, any questions about our schedule, um, anything that we've talked about in lecture or lab, um, if you'd like to ask. So Elaine's asking about um, collecting samples for making a smear. I discovered a slowly dripping pipe in my basement. I can relate to that, which leads to a puddle and it looks like sort of a swirling clouding slime. I wanna see what's in it. Very good, you sound like me. Um, should I just use a dropper or try to grow a culture? No, you can just collect material as it sits in the environment and you can make a smear from it. The tricky thing about natural sampling, so taking a sample from a natural place to try to see what's growing in it. The tricky part of that is that you don't know where the most cells are and where the least cells are. And the only way to deal with that is to take multiple samples. So if you had a little puddle in the basement, let's say you had a puddle that was a foot across, a foot in diameter. What I would do is using a, a dropper, I would collect maybe six samples. So I would make six smears and try to get a representative uh, collection of cells from that whole puddle. But yeah, you would just draw up a small amount of that watery, slimy material, put it on a slide and make your smear. Um, in all likelihood, you've got quite a collection in there. In all likelihood, there are probably bacteria in there. There are likely some uh, fungal cells. There might be algae in there. Um, there are a lot of microbes that love a wet, dark environment. 
And so um, you, you could get some very interesting stuff. Now you can make a wet mount as we talked about. You're not gonna see a lot of cellular detail, but you could certainly see if you had anything swimming in there. Um, and you could also make a smear and stain it um, and um, see what kind of actual cells you've got in there. <laughs> Ooh, the house was built in 1910. Yeah, well, that explains the, the leaky pipes. <laughs> Here in New England, we all, well, many of us live in older buildings, right? And you can find some really fascinating um, places in the house where you can sample microbes. Yeah, Elaine, please let us know. Please let us know if you discover anything. <laughs> Very good. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and pull up our slide set for today. And that's what you should be seeing on your screen now. If I can go back to the beginning here, you should see a title slide that says gram staining on it. Now, the first thing to know about gram staining is that this is someone's name so whenever we talk about gram staining, we always use a capital G uh, to recognize that that's someone's uh, surname. So our objectives this morning for this exercise are to talk first about the purpose of gram staining. Why are we gram staining? We're gonna talk about the different stains that are used because there are multiple stains and chemicals used in gram staining and what the role of each one is. We're gonna talk about the actual procedure, the step-by-step -step procedure, and then I'm gonna demonstrate it for you. And then we'll look at some gram stained smears and we'll practice determining what we call the gram status of a bacterial cell. When you hear someone refer to gram status, they're asking what the result of the gram staining procedure is. And finally, we'll finish up by talking about some of the limitations around gram staining. Every procedure that we do in the microbiology lab is going to have some limitations associated with it. And it's important that we know those limitations so we know what that procedure can do for us and what it simply cannot do for us, how we best make use of it in the laboratory. So let's talk first about why we gram stain. Remember a lot of what we're doing every day in the microbiology lab is we are trying to identify a microbe. And while there are many different types of microbes, one of the ones we work with very commonly, of course, are bacteria. So when you're trying to identify one species of bacteria from among the hundreds and hundreds and thousands of species that are on the planet, you have to at first have a way to at least put it into um, a grouping, um, one particular grouping of bacteria. And that's what gram staining does. It turns out you can divide all of the bacteria on the planet into one of two groups, what we would call gram positive and what we would call gram negative. There is a small third group called gram indeterminate, indeterminate, which of course means there are some bacterial species that we can't gram stain we can't put into one of these two groups. And we'll talk about that this morning too. So we have to remember the anatomy of a bacterial cell when we talk about gram staining. Remember from lecture that the bacterial cell has of course a cell membrane around it. All cells have a membrane. And then outside of the membrane, there's what we call a cell wall. And in that wall, in bacteria, there is a carbohydrate called peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycan, remember, is a polysaccharide. It's a complex carbohydrate, in other words. You only find it, you only find peptidoglycan in the cell wall of bacteria. It doesn't occur anywhere else 
in nature. It's a very, very strong material. And it provides those cells with protection. So a gram positive type of bacteria is the type that has a thick layer of peptidoglycan in its cell wall. A gram negative type of bacteria has a thin layer of peptidoglycan. And then beyond its cell wall, it also has what we call an outer membrane, a second membrane. So we have gram positive types of bacteria and we have gram negative types of bacteria. Now, one of the questions I get um, very commonly from students is why? Why are there these two big groups of bacteria in nature? Why do they have two such different cell walls? They all, they, they both use, they all use peptidoglycan as their cell wall material. So why is it that some of them lay down a thick layer and some of them lay down a thin layer? And the answer is evolution. The bacteria are a domain. They're a huge group. And those, uh, all of the bacteria that are in that group have taken different evolutionary pathways through history. And if you're not um, familiar with evolution or if you haven't learned about evolution in some time, remember that a lot of what happens in evolution is what we call adaptation. Organisms will mutate over time. That's a natural process. And the mutations that give them an advantage are the ones that persist. Those are the ones that end up being useful to the organism. Those are the organisms that survive and thrive and reproduce. And you start to see different types um, of organisms like bacteria emerge over time. So the key difference in those two types of bacteria is about adaptation. And some of them were better able to adapt by having a thick wall and some of them were better able to adapt by having a thin wall and then again, that outer membrane. So it's all about what worked for them, evolutionarily speaking. And while we can't say uh, very broadly um, where different kinds of bacteria live because it does um, differ species to species, um, one of the things you'll notice this semester is that a lot of gram negative bacteria, for example, live in our intestine. And um, they are therefore in an environment that is very different from a bacterium, for example, that lives on our skin, on the surface of our skin. They have different needs. They have different um, structures because they have different needs in, with regard to where they live and how they survive. So um, it's all about adaptation through evolution and evolution has produced these two big groups of bacteria. So if you're trying to identify a bacterium that comes into the laboratory, one of the very first things you're gonna do is gram stain it. You're gonna find out first what its gram status is. So let's go back in. When we talk about gram status, we're talking about the results basically of the gram staining procedure. And we report the gram status as being either gram positive or negative and, and the shape of the cell. So for example, you might get a sample of bacteria into the lab, you do your gram staining procedure and on your report, you would say this organism is a gram positive coccus, or you might say this organism is a gram negative rod, or you might say this organism is a gram negative spirochete. That is the beginning of the identification process. We know what its um, gram status is, so we know um, a little bit more 
about this organism. And if you go into any microbiology textbook, like the one you're using this semester, you can find charts and charts and charts of information about the gram status of lots of different bacteria. Again, it helps us in our, um, our journey of trying to identify a bacterial species. On this slide, you're looking at a couple of drawings that I showed you in lecture as well, or um, I think it's in this week's lecture. I'm not sure if it was in the, the lectures you did uh, prior to that. But this is a drawing that demonstrates for us the difference between gram positive and gram negative cell walls in bacteria. So you have to use your imagination a little bit here. Um, if you start over here on the gram positive side, they're showing us just a little sliver, a little sliver of the cell wall, the cell membrane and the cell wall from this organism. So if you were to draw the whole organism, it wouldn't fit on your screen. They've just taken a little slice out of the edge of the cell. Here's the membrane, here's a drawing of the membrane. And again, you can see the two layers of phospholipids, the heads and the tails and the heads and the tails. So this in here, this white space in here would be where the cytoplasm is. And out here, this would be where the outside world is. So you have all the internal workings of the cell, you have the cell membrane, there's a little bit of space, and then you have the cell wall. Now this cell wall is drawn as these purple strands. And remember, that's how peptidoglycan is produced. It's a polysaccharide. So individual sugars or individual carbohydrates are joined together to make these long strands. And then those strands are joined together. So you get this nice big thick layer of peptidoglycan in a gram positive organism. Now, if you compare that to a gram negative organism, the peptidoglycan layer is much thinner. There's just less of it. But there is also a second membrane. So if you start inside the bacterial cell and you move outwards, you're first going to hit the cell membrane. Then again, there's going to be a little bit of space. Then you're going to hit the cell wall. You're going to hit peptidoglycan first, a thin layer of it, and it is going to be attached to a second membrane. So it's that second membrane that faces the outside world. Notice that the peptidoglycan is attached to that second membrane. That's what these little purple lines represent. And the anatomy of this outer membrane is gonna be very different from the cell membrane. This membrane serves a different purpose. And one of the most notable things that it has in it, or I should say on it, are these green structures here that are jutting off the outside of the membrane. This is that LPS material. The term that um, LPS stands for is lipopolysaccharide. And we shorthand that word as LPS. Now the LPS is there for a reason. It helps to uh, strengthen that cell wall and protect that cell. But in medicine, we care about LPS because LPS is a toxic molecule to us. And in our intestines, for example, when large numbers of bacterial cells die, large numbers of gram negative bacterial cells die, they release that LPS as the cell degrades, as it's broken apart. And that LPS is toxic to us. We call it an endotoxin. Remember, endo means within. So it's a toxin that comes from within our own bodies sometimes when uh, disease states cause large numbers of gram-negative bacteria to die inside our gut. LPS is also a really big problem in horses. I can tell you from the veterinary world, um, if you're not familiar, horses are um, constantly getting gastrointestinal 
problems. And um, one of them we just sort of generally refer to as colic. And horses that are colicking will often have a die off of bacteria. It, it's just part of the disease process. The, the state of the intestine is so unhealthy that a lot of the normal microbiome dies. And all of those gram negative cells as they die are gonna release all of that LPS and it gets into the horse's bloodstream. It can make them very, very sick. It will put them into shock. And if it's not treated, it will kill them. Um, and again, that can happen in humans as well. All right, so two very different cell walls, two different gram statuses, two different groups of bacteria. So when we're trying to identify a bacterium, we can first figure out which of those two enormous groups it belongs to, either the gram negative group or the gram positive group. Now, we talked the last time we were together about staining terminology. We talked about simple staining. We talked about differential staining. We also talked about direct versus negative staining. Well, gram staining is a differential direct staining technique. So remember that means that multiple stains are being used. We're gonna apply them one after the other. And since it's direct, it means that we're staining the cells themselves. Now, gram staining involves two processes that uh, we haven't talked about yet. One is decolorization and one is counter staining. So some more terminology for us. Sometimes when we stain um, a smear, there are reasons that we might want to remove at least part of what we just put on. And I will talk about why in just a minute. That's referred to as decolorization. So we put a color on the cell and then we remove at least part of it through decolorization. Counter staining is a process where after we remove the first stain, we add a second stain. So we're counter staining. We're using an alternative stain. That's what that refers to. So because it's differential, gram staining has several steps to it because there are several chemicals involved and a couple of different stains. The order of application of these four chemicals is first the crystal violet. I talked about crystal violet just briefly when we talked about simple staining. Crystal violet is considered the primary stain, the first stain, the major stain of gram staining. And it's gonna turn the cell a purple color. Some people think it looks a little more blue than purple. It's kind of a personal thing. But like the name suggests, the violet is um, referring to that purplish color. The second chemical that we're gonna be using is called Grams Iodine. Again, capital G because it's uh, named after someone. Grams Iodine is not the same kind of iodine that you might use um, on a cut or you might use to um, clean off the skin for a medical procedure. Gram's iodine is a modified form of regular old iodine. And it's used in this procedure because it has a mordant property. Now, a mordant is a chemical that helps a stain penetrate and adhere. If you've ever had any um, opportunity to uh, work with dyes, for example, with textiles, when you uh, tie dye something or when you dye, um, let's say yarn or anything like that, anything that you were trying to um, put a, a dye onto to give it color, you have to apply a chemical called a mordant somewhere in the process. It's gonna help the stain or the dye get through the material and it's gonna help it adhere to the material so that this thing that you're uh, dyeing, the color will last longer, basically. 
So when we use it in gram staining, we're trying to help that crystal violet penetrate through the peptidoglycan and adhere to it. We want it to get all the way through the layers. We want it to stick tightly because we're trying to impart that blue purple color to the cell. Now, the third chemical that we use in the gram staining procedure is just a plain old alcohol, but it's being used again as a decolorizer. So we just put the crystal violet on and we helped it to penetrate with the Graham's iodine. Now we're going to use a decolorizer step. So we are gonna purposefully, purposefully remove some of the crystal violet. And again, we'll talk about it in a little more detail in just a sec. Then after we decolorize, we're gonna counter stain. And the counter stain we use is called safranin. Safranin will turn a cell a pinkish red color. So anywhere that we have been successful at decolorizing, we're now gonna counter stain with safranin and turn it this pinkish red color. Take a look at this diagram, which I think really helps us to see what's happening through this process called gram staining. On the left side of your screen, they're showing you um, a cell. It happens to be a gram positive type of bacteria. It happens to be a caucus, right? It's got a round or a spherical shape. On the right-hand side, we've got another organism we're told is a gram negative bacterium. It happens to have a rod shape. Don't think that all gram positive bacteria are cocci and all gram negative bacteria are rods. That's not the case. Um, they're just using this as an example. So the first thing you have to do when you gram stain is you have to make a smear because we're staining. So of course you would have to apply your cells to the slide, let them dry. Then you would go through your fixation process to get them to stick to the slide. And then you would start gram staining. So remember the first, the first step is the application of this primary stain called crystal violet. And you can see on both sides of the diagram, the cells have turned this purple color. Then we're gonna apply the Graham's iodine and that's gonna help that purple color penetrate and adhere. Now in the drawing, what the artist has done is he's just changed it to a slightly different shade of purple. So he's just showing us that a change has occurred here. The cell is still purple, but there has been a change because we've helped push that dye all the way through the peptidoglycan and we've helped it to adhere. Now here comes the magic of gram staining. Now we're gonna decolorize. Now this is where the anatomy of the cell wall comes into play. Remember a gram positive cell has a thick layer of peptidoglycan around it. A gram negative cell has a thin layer. We're gonna decolorize, we're gonna remove color, but we're gonna do it for a very short, very, um, set period of time. So we're gonna pull out the purple color for a very short amount of time. It turns out to be 10 seconds. So we're gonna remove some crystal violet from the gram positive cell, but because there's such a thick layer of peptidoglycan around this cell, the cell is still gonna be purple when we're done. We are taking some of the crystal violet away but we're not taking enough away that we take the purple color away. Now compare that to the gram negative. The gram negative cell has a very thin layer of peptidoglycan around it. So even 10 seconds of decolorization is gonna remove all of it. So now we have one type of cell that looks purple and we have another type of cell where we've removed the stain. This is where, again, the magic of gram staining occurs. Now you have to put on your counter stain here. You have to apply the safranin, 
the gram positive cell is not gonna pick up any safranin because it's already purple. There's already the crystal violet dye stuck to the peptidoglycan. The gram negative cell will counter stain because we took all the crystal violet away. So the gram negative cell will stain with the safranin and turn pink. So at the end of this procedure, you can visually see the difference between a gram positive type of bacteria and a gram negative type of bacteria because they will be different colors. The gram positive cells will appear purple. Any gram negative cells will appear pink. Elaine, yes, vinegar with certain types of dyes and stains, vinegar, which is a weak acid, vinegar can be used as a mordant. That's right. So a lot of folks who do dyeing at home of textiles and things, um, they can use uh, certain preparations of vinegar um, as their mordant. That's right. That's very good. Yeah, that's right. There's a whole class of dyes that are used, for example, with yarns, natural fiber yarns. So wool and alpaca and things like that, um, that are called acid dyes and they require an acid as a mordant. So yeah, if your mom um, dyes her own yarn, um, that's why she's using that vinegar. Yeah, very easy and inexpensive, right? Very good. So John is asking, is this method, this gram staining method, is this used to confirm gram positive versus gram negative? And the answer is yes. So if you think about it, let's say you get um, a urine sample into the laboratory and you've got a patient who shows all the signs of having a bladder infection, a bacterial bladder infection. And you um, do a wet mount, as we've talked about, and you can see that there are bacteria in the urine. So you want to identify that bacterium. You want to know what it is. Remember, we already have clinical experience. So we already have an idea what it probably is. It might be E. coli or Klebsiella or Proteus. Um, these are common genera of bacteria that cause bladder infections in humans. But we need to we need to identify it because that's gonna help the physician choose which antibiotic to give to that patient. So one of the first tests we do is the gram stain because gram staining is gonna help us narrow down our list of possibilities. In other words, once I know the gram status, I've already cut out a whole lot of bacteria. It can't be all of those bacteria because it has a gram status of this. Now you can't just do a gram stain. Knowing the gram status of something, it's cutting out a whole lot of possibilities for you, but you're left still with a lot of possibilities. So you have to keep testing. You have to keep doing other tests. But the gram stain gives you that first piece of information. Is it gram positive or is it gram negative? Remember too that part of the gram status is the shape of the cell because that's also gonna give us information. If we know it's a caucus, then we have eliminated any bacteria that is not a caucus. We've shortened down our list of suspects. So gram staining is very, very important in the laboratory, often the first test that we do. All right, so on this slide, I have written out the procedure for you to have. You don't um, have to jot it all down right now. You could certainly come back um, and look at the video or the slides that are up on Canvas again. But this is the step-by-step -step for gram staining with all of the details added in. So remember, we first have to prepare the smear and heat fix the smear of whatever sample of bacteria we're trying to identify. We're gonna apply the crystal violet first. We're gonna let it sit for 30 seconds. Now, this is a protocol 
where timing does not have to be exact. Gram staining does not have to have um, an exact, very precise timing associated with the stains. You don't wanna leave that crystal violet on for 10 seconds, that's not gonna be long enough. But if you leave it on for 32 seconds or 28 seconds or 35 seconds, you're gonna be fine. It's not gonna ruin it. There are a lot of protocols in science where timing has to be very sharp, very specific, but gram staining is not one of those. So approximately 30 seconds for the crystal violet. Now we've got crystal violet on the smear at this point, so we have to get rid of it. And what we're gonna do is gently rinse away the puddle of crystal violet off of the smear. And we're gonna do it with distilled water or what we shorthand as DH2O in the lab. Now here's a question. Why do I wanna use distilled water? Why can't I just use tap water? Why do I need to use my expensive distilled water to rinse off my slide? Why don't I just rinse it off with tap water? What's the big deal? Yep, you've got it. Connie and Carrie and Elaine and John, you've got it. Because tap water can have bacteria in it. That always freaks people out when you tell them that, but. <laughs> Tap water commonly, in fact, has a few bacterial cells in it. The other thing tap water has as, um, who said it? Carrie said it. Um, tap water also can have other particulates in it and that can at least um, you know, dirty up your smear. <laughs> um, but you certainly would not wanna add a, a cell onto your smear that wasn't in your original sample. No, tap water is not loaded with bacteria, but it can have you know, stray bacterial cells in it. And we don't wanna add those accidentally to our slide. So we always use a distilled water, a water that's had any of those things removed from it. And we're just gonna very gently rinse off the extra crystal violet from our slide. It is gross. <laughs> Carrie, um, it is true it is true that um, as our water gets purified for us to drink, a lot of cells are removed. A lot of particulate matter is removed from, um, from our drinking water. But you should know as a consumer, you should know that it is okay for our drinking water to have a certain number of living bacterial cells in it. That often freaks people out when you tell them that. But there are standards of our drinking water and our drinking water is allowed to have a certain number of living things in it, but it's a very small number. It's a number that's not going to harm the vast majority of us. Um, so when you get a water quality report, for example, from your local um, water company, whoever's supplying your municipal water or whatever, one of the things that'll be on that report is what are, what's called coliforms, the coliform count. And you're allowed to have, I, I believe, don't, don't quote me on this, but I believe it's one to three cells per volume of water. Um, coliforms, as we're gonna talk about this semester, are a type of bacteria that live in our intestine. And so they, um, the reason our water would be contaminated with them is because um, animals uh, defecate, animals poop, and natural water sources get contaminated with the bacteria that live in our intestine. Now, a lot of coliforms are not gonna harm us. In fact, they're a normal part of our intestinal microbiome. But there's one little bugger coliform that can cause a lot of disease in humans. And that's a particular strain of E. coli. So we monitor how many coliforms are in our water because we're very concerned about allowing this dangerous pathogenic E. coli to get into our water. So one of the things we do is we count the number of bacterial cells, again, per volume 
of drinking water. Um, and they're looking to make sure that um, the coliforms are not um, creeping up in the water. So yeah, um, it's a little gross to think that, well, gosh, so if I'm drinking a gallon of water, I might be drinking one or two um, coliform cells. It's, it's gross to think about, but you have to remember, number one, it's most likely not a harmful bacterium. And number two, if it is a harmful bacterium, if it is pathogenic, it's such a small number that your immune system, your immune system is going to get rid of it without even blinking. It's going to be so easy for you to get rid of it. Um, so it's not going to harm you. But yeah, our drinking water has strict standards associated with it. If you are drinking a municipal water supply, if you're on a well, it's different though, right? If you're on a well, it's different. You've got to monitor your own water. Um, you can do that by sending samples to the state laboratory and they will do the water quality testing for you. Good questions. Oh, Elaine's asking about amoebas. <laughs> um, do they offer any nutritional benefit, the dead ones? Listen, um, living cells, cellular material, or what we would often refer to as organic material. And remember, in science, the word organic means carbon containing. So it's different from the popular use of the word organic. Carbon containing material, which is what living cellular material is, it does have nutritional benefit. It's made out of the things that our bodies are made out of. It's just that you would have to eat a lot of a microbe in order to get any nutritional benefit out of it. But yeah, a dead bacterial cell, a dead amoeba, a dead algal cell has nutritional benefit in it because it contains carbon and hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen. And our bodies can use those things. So um, yeah, that's an interesting question. All right, back to the protocol. We're gonna gently rinse off the crystal violet with distilled water. We are not gonna dry the slide at this point because we're still gonna apply more wet fluids to it in the next part of the protocol. The next chemical that goes on is our Graham's iodine, our mordant. We're gonna let that sit for 30 seconds. And again, we're gonna gently rinse that off with distilled water. It's important to remember to do these rinse steps because we have to get all this excessive fluid off of the smear before we apply the next chemical. The next chemical that goes on is our decolorizer. And this is the most technical part of gram staining. This is the step that we have to be careful with our timing. First of all, we're not gonna put our decolorizer in a puddle on the smear. Instead, we're gonna apply it drop by drop over the smear for 10 seconds only. I'm gonna show you this in the demonstration, but you wanna hold the slide at this point and you wanna hold it at an angle. So as the decolorizer lands on the smear, drop by drop by drop, it's gonna run off the slide. When the 10 seconds are up, you stop, you gently rinse with distilled water. Now this rinse is especially important because if you forgot to rinse here, the decolorizer would sit on that smear for longer than 10 seconds. So it's really critical that when you are decolorizing, you keep your timing correct. And the reason for that is because if you over decolorize, if you over decolorize your smear, what's gonna happen is you will pull all of the crystal violet out of your gram positive cell. Remember in 10 seconds, that's gonna be enough time to pull the crystal violet out of the gram negative peptidoglycan, but not enough time 
to pull it all out of the gram positive one. So the 10 seconds is just the right amount of time to get rid of the purple in, in a gram negative type of cell, but keep the purple in a gram positive type of cell. So one of the things, one of the issues we have when we're first learning gram staining, students tend to either over decolorize or under decolorize. If you don't decolorize for 10 seconds, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to leave some purple in your gram negative cells. So at the end, everything's going to look purple. If you over decolorize, everything's going to look pink. So you have to practice this. You have to get, you have to build up your confidence in knowing how long to decolorize in doing the 10 seconds and feeling confident that you've done it and then stopping <laughs> and rinsing. Um, and again, it just takes practice. It just takes a, you just have to try it a few times to get practice. Now, Elaine's asking, let's say I accidentally decolorize for too long and I, I end up pulling all the purple out. Can I go back in with my crystal violet? Here's the thing, Elaine, you're not gonna know that you overdid it until you take that slide to the microscope. So that means you will have finished the whole process by then. You will have counterstained by then, it'll be too late. If you put it under the, the microscope and you feel like you've, you've over decolorized, you've ruined your smear, you just have to start again. You just have to do another smear, stain it again and go, go back in. But yeah, it's very, very common when you're first learning to either overdo it or underdo it on the decolorization. In fact, in my experience, most students actually underdo it because they're so concerned that they're gonna overdo it that they don't apply enough. Um, you don't wanna skimp on it. You, don't, you wanna make sure to decolorize. You just don't wanna do it for too long a period of time. All right. So we apply the decolorizer, we rinse it off, then we apply our very last chemical, which is our counter stain, the safranin. Now the safranin is the stain we're gonna leave on longer than the others. Safranin, you're gonna let sit for 60 seconds. Again, these timings, other than the decolorizer, they don't have to be perfect, but you should know, you should know that Crystal violet is 30, 30 seconds. Graham's iodine is 30 seconds. Decolorizer is 10 seconds. Safranin is 60 seconds. You need to leave the safranin on a little bit longer. It's just a, it's a different chemical. It's a different stain and it just takes a little bit longer to do its job. After the 60 seconds is over, I'm gonna gently rinse away the excess safranin and now I'm done. Now I can blot my slide dry and I can take a look under the microscope. So what I'm gonna do now is walk us through a demonstration of how to gram stain. Um, we, we won't use as much video today. We'll use still images today, but I'll um, narrate as we go through each image. So, we're gonna imagine that um, we got um, a sample into the laboratory and our job is to determine the gram status of whatever it is that's growing in this sample. So obviously in this image, I'm holding a test tube that has culture broth in it. Remember, this is what we would use to purposefully grow a pure culture of bacteria in the lab. In this case, with a patient sample, this would not be what we would be doing. If we had a urine sample, for example, we would take that urine out of the patient's um, specimen cup, we would put it into a container, we would spin it down to get that sediment again. And then we would use the sediment um, for to make our smear. We would take some of that material, that pellet material, and we would make a smear with it on a slide. But let's use this image to review for ourselves 
how we handle either pure culture material or patient samples. Remember, we don't want to get them contaminated when we handle them. So always a gloved hand. And if you're opening a container, you don't want it straight up and down. You want to hold it at an angle so that the microbes that are in the air are not allowed to fall down and contaminate that material. We keep our sample containers at an angle. We hold um, container tops like this screw top cap for the test tube in our hands. We don't put it down on the desk. I'm gonna use an inoculating loop in this image that would have been sterilized first, either in an open flame or in an incinerator. I'm gonna place it in, I'm gonna put it to the middle of the sample and I'm gonna draw out a loop full. That's all you need. You don't need a lot of material for this. Now, remember that when you spread cells onto a, a slide, you start in the center and you do ever increasingly large circles until you get a nice wide smear across the central third of your slide. Let's watch it again. I'm touching it to the center and then I'm just making my circles wider and wider. I'm just spreading that material out over the central third of my slide. Use your slide, use the real estate on this slide. All right, make a nice big smear on your slide. Oh, I should say, notice that my slide is labeled. A lot of times when we're making smears, we're not making one, we're making a bunch of them. We don't usually get one urine sample into the lab each day. We're gonna get several of them. So go ahead and batch your gram staining, make several slides and make sure that they're all carefully labeled. Now I did wanna show you this. Remember we said it's really critical that our smears are dry before we uh, heat fix them. Um, we said you can lay a slide down on a, um, a clean desktop on a piece of paper towel or something and let it air dry. You can put it onto a slide warmer if you want to. The other thing you can do is just this. A lot of people will do this in the laboratory. There's nothing wrong with this. Notice I'm holding the slide at an angle and I'm just sort of waving it in the air. I'm not being aggressive about my waving. <laughs> I'm just gently waving the slide about. Um, you'll see people doing this in the laboratory. There's nothing really wrong with this. Um, you don't want to, um, you don't want to do anything uh, that is going to harm yourself or your colleagues in a laboratory. It's very important that smears are dry before you stain them. So um, however you can make that happen. Remember we're gonna, if we're using our incinerator for heat fixation, we're gonna take our dried smear, we're gonna use some kind of an instrument, a, a wooden clothespin like you see here, or hemostats or some kind of an instrument that's gonna keep our fingers away from the hot. So whether you're using an open flame or an incinerator, use something to hold the slide. And then for the incinerator, at least, I'm gonna just lay the glass slide onto this housing, this metal housing, which is hot. And I'm gonna count between 20 to 30 seconds of time in order to apply enough heat to fix those cells to the slide. Um, when we're first learning, it's often quite helpful for us to mark off where our smear is. So before we even make the smear, we take a Sharpie pen or a wax pencil and we just draw ourselves a nice circle in the center of the slide. And then when I'm placing my cells onto the slide, I just put them inside the circle. That's gonna help me find my smear when I go to the microscope. So it's very commonly done by students when they're first learning how to focus the microscope. It just helps you find your cells quickly. 
Um, you don't typically see experienced technicians doing that, but um, certainly when we're first learning, it's very uh, appropriate. Once the smear is made and the smear is heat fixed, now we're ready for gram staining. Now I wanna show you this picture. As you can see on the slide, there's um, a plain, uh, very inexpensive plastic uh, Tupperware kind of dish. It's just a little um, empty, again, really cheap plastic container that you might store food in. This is what we call a staining tray in the microbiology lab. Um, it's something that we're gonna use while we're staining in order to collect the waste material. You can see that this tray has been used a bunch of times because it's all stained. Even plastic will pick up stain. Um, all that has happened is this plastic box has been modified by running a couple of zip ties. You poke a couple holes into the wall of the container and you just run a plastic zip tie. What you're trying to create is a shelf, just a little shelf that you can set your slides on while you're staining them. And all of the excess stain is gonna just be um, dropped down into the slide tray or the staining tray so that you can collect it and hold on to it until you're ready to put it into the hazardous waste bottle. Remember, we don't put stain down the drain. It doesn't matter what stain it is, you don't put it down the drain. With the amount of stain that is used every single day in this country and around the world, we don't put it down the drain. It's a hazardous material and it's our responsibility to handle it appropriately in the lab. So we stain over these trays so that we can collect it. Now, remember from the simple staining lab, sometimes our tray is just a bowl. You can buy a bowl for the laboratory and you can just you know, dedicate it to be your staining bowl. And you can dump all your extra stain in there while you're working. But the nice thing about a tray is that you've created the shelf. You've created a little shelf where you can set your slides down. You can set multiple slides down and you can stain. So that's the difference between using just a bowl for your staining uh, container and using one of what we call a staining tray. <laughs> Tell me what your lab professor would have a cow about. <laughs> I love these stories. Are you talking about if, if, if they saw somebody putting it down the drain? Oh, waving a slide in the air, yeah. Um, Listen, one of the things I wanna do um, in this course is I wanna show you what really happens in laboratories. Um, what's good practice and what's not good practice. Yeah, um, it's really common to see people doing this. Um, it's not horrible. It's not gonna cause, it's not gonna increase the risk to you or to your lab mates. Is it ideal to wave a slide like that? No. It's not ideal because remember there are microbes in the air and you know, in theory, you could be adding microbes, but um, if you don't have um, a slide warmer in the lab and it's your job to uh, make these smears and stain them and get the work done today or this morning, sometimes you would, you would do this to get the slide to dry more quickly. Um, you've got, the most important thing is you've got to get that smear dry before you heat fix it. That's the key. Now, gram staining is so popular. It's so commonly done every day, not only in uh, healthcare related diagnostic labs, but also in research laboratories, um, you just you can buy a kit for gram staining. And that's what you're looking at here. Now, these kits are available from any supply house that would um, provide uh, laboratory supplies. So this one happens to be um, a kit that was made by uh, 
Becton Dickinson, that's the BD um, symbol that you see there. And as you can see, you get these four containers in the kit. Now this is either a 500, I think this is a 500 ml bottle. So this is a lot of gram staining material. But if you're working in a busy laboratory, this is what would be purchased by the lab manager because you're gonna go through this. If you're doing gram staining every day, you're gonna go through this material um, relatively quickly. So in other words, you buy it in bulk. You buy large amounts of these four chemicals for gram staining purposes. Now on this slide, you can see our staining tray is set up on the desktop. You can see that I've got one, two, three slides sitting on that zip tie shelf. And I am starting my gram staining procedure. So the, these are the slides I showed you a few seconds ago that have the um, circles drawn on them, the Sharpie circles where the smear is. So what I'm doing is I'm using a sterile pipette to draw up some gram stain, some crystal violet first. And I'm placing lots of crystal violet over the smear. Remember, you want to flood your smear with stain. Don't be stingy with stains. They're not that expensive. And it is in your best interest to make sure that the smear is completely covered with stain. You know, you can see over here on this slide, there's even more than um, where the smear is. There's so much stain on here, it's sort of heading off towards each end of the slide. That's okay. It's better to put too much stain on than not enough. We're gonna let those slides, those three slides sit here for 30 seconds. We're gonna give that crystal violet 30 seconds to stain the peptidoglycan in the cell wall. Now I need to rinse. I need to get the excessive crystal violet off. Um, you don't have to use your clothespin or your hemostat here. It just makes it a little cleaner. If you were to grab the slide with your gloved hand, you might get crystal violet all over your gloves. It's not a big deal, but the way I was taught was go ahead and hold the slide with something else. Hold the slide with a clothespin, with a hemostat, pick it up off of the zip tie shelf and rinse off the crystal violet. You can see that this clothespin has been used a lot just for this purpose. That's why it's all stained. It's stained with crystal violet. It's stained with saffronin. Uh, better to stain the clothespin than stain your hands. Now, a couple of things I want you to notice. I'm holding the slide at an angle over the stain tray. What is in this pipette, this is a sterile transfer pipette, and all I've filled it up with is distilled water. And I'm just rinsing off, gently rinsing off the excessive crystal violet and I'm letting it fall right down into the stain tray. I want you to notice something. Inside my circle here where my smear is, I don't see anything. I mean, I might see a couple of spots of purple here, but I really don't see anything. That's what we expect. You are not gonna see your smear turn purple. You should not see your smear turn purple. If you have a visually purple smear at this point, you've got too many cells on your smear. We don't stain the slide, we stain the cells. And if I've done a good job making my smear, I've got a nice thin single layer of cells on that slide. And I'm not gonna see any color because I won't see those cells until I look under the microscope. So this is what we typically see after we rinse. We just don't see anything, right? We don't see anything, it just looks clear. There's a little drop of purple right there, but most of what we're looking at is just a clear slide at this point. Now it's time for our Grams iodine. Again, I'm using a sterile transfer pipette to draw up some Grams iodine. In some laboratories, what, we'll, what you'll see is 
some of this gram's iodine will be put into a squirt bottle, just a little squirt bottle, so that I can just squirt the gram's iodine out onto the slide. But you can also just draw it up with one of those inexpensive transfer pipettes. Remember, Graham's iodine is a mordant. It's going to help the crystal violet both penetrate and adhere to the peptidoglycan. I'm going to put it onto my slides. I'm going to put plenty of it on, and I'm going to let it sit again for 30 seconds. Now I'm going to do my next rinse. I'm going to take my distilled water and I'm going to gently rinse off the grams iodine into my stain container. Now comes the decolorizer. Decolorizer is just an alcohol. Um, it depends on the kit that you buy, um, what it's going to actually, what uh, molecule it's actually going to be but it's gonna be um, something that can pull the crystal violet stain out of the cell. Now, this is a short video, again, just to show you this, uh, this decolorizing process. This time, instead of squirting a bunch of distilled water over my slide until um, I get most of the excess material off, this time I'm gonna very purposefully drip decolorizer down over my smear. So I'm going to apply it in a way that I feel like it's hitting all of my smear and rolling off. It's going to roll down the slide. So I'm holding the slide at an angle while I decolorize. I'm not making a puddle of decolorizer while the, while the slide sits on the shelf. I'm actively decolorizing and I'm going to do it for 10 seconds. So let's, um, let's make this a little bit larger for us and play this short clip and you can watch decolorizing. See what I'm doing? I'm just drip, 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 drip over the surface of the slide. And I am counting in my head, typically the 10 second period. And when it's over, it's done. I'm done. So let's watch. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. I'm all done now. All right, that's it. That's decolorization. It's very basic, but it's intimidating because you know that if it doesn't go exactly the way you want it to, you're going to have to do it again. That's intimidating. The important thing is that once you're finished with that, that you rinse because you've got to stop the decolorizer from doing its work. So you do your 10 seconds and then you rinse your slide. Now comes the last step, which is the counter stain. The slides go back down on the shelf for this. I make a nice big puddle of saffronin over my smear. And then I'm going to let it sit for 60 seconds this time to let the saffronin do its job. I have to rinse the saffronin off just like I rinsed everything else off. And now I'm going to use that bilbis paper to just blot my slides. Remember, your slide does not need to be 100% dry in order for you to put it on the microscope but you wanna remove as much of that fluid, as much of that rinse fluid as possible. So I lay my slides down on a piece of this bilbis paper, which is just a thick, very absorbent paper. And I like to fold it over and then gently blot the slides. That's my preference. Now I'm ready to go. Now I have my wonderful smears ready to examine. Notice that the slides don't look super pretty, do they? There's some staining on parts of the slide over where I didn't even put any cells. That's fine, don't worry about that. This is the key right here, this central area where I put my smear. And I won't know until I get under the microscope whether or not I've been successful. I do want you to also notice on this slide that notice that part of the circle is gone on this. 
not so much on this one, but over here too, part of my label even is gone. One thing that you should know is that decolorizer will remove Sharpie pen. Now we've only decolorized for 10 seconds, so you're not gonna remove all of it in 10 seconds, but you will remove Sharpie with decolorizer. So some people prefer to use what's called waxed pencil instead when they're gram staining. You've probably seen waxed pencils. They're the ones that you have to unpeel the pencil as you go. And it's like a very waxy crayon, essentially. That material does not come off with decolorizer. Most people in the laboratory who have experience, if they need a Sharpie pen or they use a Sharpie pen for labeling purposes, it's fine. They just, they, they're careful not to get the decolorizer up on the labeled area. But when you're first learning, you might want to instead use a wax pencil so you don't accidentally take that little circle off and then you have trouble finding your smear under the microscope. <laughs> yes, Elaine, if you've ever, if you have children, grandchildren, um, Sharpie pen is the worst invention ever made because kids love Sharpies and kids use Sharpies in the house all the time. I have a nephew who, um, he's autistic. He's such a wonderful little boy, but he doesn't like drawing on paper. He likes drawing on walls. And, um, and he's actually my grand nephew. And um, his dad, who's my nephew, I keep just shaking my head at him and saying, why? Do you have Sharpies in your house? <laughs> you should not have Sharpies in your house. You shouldn't because this child is going to find the Sharpies and he's going to decorate your walls. Um, but yeah, just you might want to try if you ever get into a mess with your kids and Sharpie pens, try some alcohol. It may not take it all off, but, um, but it is helpful sometimes to get Sharpie pen off of places where it shouldn't go. <laughs> All right. Now, before we take a look at some gram stained slides, let me ask if anybody has any questions about the procedure. Does the procedure make sense to you? Do you understand the order of the chemicals? Do you understand the, you know, the, the process? And do you understand what's happening? That's important too. Do you understand what we're staining, the peptidoglycan, and how decolorizing affects a gram-negative cell different from a gram-positive cell? Because there's just less peptidoglycan around a gram-negative cell. So it's easier for us to remove the crystal violet from that cell than from a gram-positive. Remember, when we start, we don't know if we have a gram positive or a gram negative. So by doing the gram staining, we're gonna find out. We're gonna find out which category it belongs to. Yes, Elaine, I, I also like Sharpie pens and I, um, I have a lot of them in every color, but boy, when my grandkids are over, Sharpie pens are away. <laughs> All right, let's take a look. So this image that you're looking at um, on the slide right now, this is a gram stained smear. Let me make it a little bit larger for us. It's a little bit out of focus. I apologize for that. Um, I really like this smear though, because um, it shows us the power of gram staining. Now, obviously this, does, this is a slide, a smear, that does not have one kind of organism on it. The shapes of these cells alone would tell us that there are two different types of organisms here. But the gram staining really drives that home. I can see purple on this slide and I can see pink on this slide. So you're looking at the color of crystal violet, that purpley blue, and the color of saffronin, what is often called pink or red pink. Remember, gram staining is about the color and the shape of the cells. 
So I can see on this slide that I've got round or spherical cells. Remember, those are cocci. And I've also got rod shaped cells, or what we also sometimes called bacilli. You can, you can call these cells either rods or bacilli. Either one of that, either one of those would be appropriate. Notice though, I want you to notice the background. I've got a nice, clean, clear white background. I made this smear. This is not um, this is not um, a smear that was made from a patient sample. If this was made from a body fluid sample, the background would not be so pristine. It would not be so white. But because I manufactured this slide myself, um, that's why you have such a nice clean background. But you clearly can see two different shapes of cells and two different colors. So if I was reporting about this slide, I would say I have a mixed population of cells. I have more than one cell type here. I have a gram positive coccus, whatever this purple organism is, it, its gram status is gram positive coccus because of its shape. And I also have a gram negative rod or a gram negative bacillus. I should also mention while we're looking at this slide that we are under 1000 X total magnification here. Remember under a light microscope, Bacteria are visible at 40X, but they're much better visualized at one under the 100X lens. So 1000 times total magnification. I can clearly see the shape and the color of these organisms. The other thing to remember is that while it is quite common for cocci, to be gram positive. It just happens that a lot of species of bacteria that are cocci also happen to be gram positive. It's also true that a whole lot of species of bacteria that are gram negative are rod shaped. It just, it's just a truth in nature. But you should always remember that there are gram negative cocci and there are gram-positive rods. So we see all combinations, in other words. You can see gram-positive cocci, you can see gram-negative cocci, you can see gram-positive rods, you can see gram-negative rods. You can see gram-positive spirochetes, you can see gram-negative spirochetes. So the combinations, sometimes it feels like when you start to get experience, it will feel like, oh, it's a caucus, so it's probably gram positive. That's true in a sense because there are a lot of gram positive caucuses out there in the world. But don't ever fool yourself into thinking that all cocci are gram positive, all rods are gram negative, because it's just not true. It's just not true. All right. Okay, let's go on and look at another smear now. Take a look at this one here. This too has two different organisms on it. This is a mixed culture. So in other words, some kind of sample material came into the lab and we cultured it. So we put cells into a broth or onto an auger plate. And we purposefully grew up this bacteria in the laboratory. So we had lots of it to examine. I made the gram stain from that culture, which is why the smear has such a nice, pretty white background. But I think you can clearly see that this is a mixed culture. There is not one organism here. This is not a pure culture, which would have one organism. There are two organisms present on this slide. I have got purple rods 
and I've got pink rods. Do yourself a favor when you're evaluating a smear. Always look all around. Don't just glance at it and say, oh, purple rods, pink rods. Look all the way around at it. Look at the cells. Just glance all the way around your field and look. The purple rods, in my opinion, are easier to identify as rods on the slide than the pink ones are. If I wasn't careful, if I just glanced right here, for example, I might think that I have a pink caucus, right? I see little circles here. But if you look all the way around the slide, you can see, oh, no, these are rods. Remember, cells are three-dimensional structures. And depending on how they land on the slide, you may look at some of them lengthwise. And you may be looking at some of them end on. So always look all around at the slide, at the smear first before you make your determination. And on this slide, we have both gram positive and gram negative rods visible. So two different organisms on that slide. Now, it's very common when we're looking at patient samples and we're trying to identify bacteria that are causing disease in a patient. It's very common to see more than one type of organism. Um, you have to learn to um, not, not always use um, exact science, but also sometimes use a little art in the laboratory. Because the other thing you're going to find on a smear that's made with a body fluid is a whole lot of nothing, a whole lot of what we would refer to as debris on a slide. Remember, body fluids have molecules in them. Body fluids can have human cells in them. We're interested in the microbe, though. So you're not going to see in a, patient, in a slide that was made from body fluid from a patient, whether it's blood or urine or CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, or any other kind of fluid, you're not going to see a nice clean smear like the ones we just saw. You're gonna see bits and pieces of debris in there too. And they're gonna stain purple and pink. Not because they're bacteria, not because they have peptidoglycan in them, but because crystal violet and safranin will stain other things too. So you always have to know what you are looking at and at what magnification Am I looking at a smear that was made from a pure culture in a, in a research laboratory? Or am I looking at a smear that was made from someone's body fluid? You have to know that and you have to know what magnification you're looking at. Because if you're looking under a 4X lens, a low power lens, and you see little purple dots, those are not bacteria. They are too big. We cannot see bacteria under a low power lens. Okay. So those are the kinds of things you've got to constantly ask yourself, what am I looking at? What am I looking at? And under what power? All right. Let's go to the next one now. Take a look at this gram stain. And take a look at this gram stain. I want you to notice something. This picture was taken under the 40X lens, the high dry lens. So that's a 400 times total magnification. This happens to be an organism, uh, a staphylococcus organism. I think you can clearly see that it is purple. You may or may not be able to clearly see that these cells are round. Some people might need to go up to the 100X lens to feel confident that these cells are cocci. That's what they are. Down at the bottom, you're looking at a gram negative rod. Same color, 
Rod, share your screen. Whoops, sorry. Thank you. Hold on, let me try again. Have you got it now? If you don't, or if you don't see it, if you don't see the screen, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and let me know. Thank you for letting me know, by the way, a minute ago. So, gram positive at the top, purple. Gram negative at the bottom, pink. This is under 40X. I can see it's purple. I can see bacteria under 40X. I can just see that these are cocci. I would rather take a look under 100X though, because when I get to 100X, I just see the cells more clearly. This one is under 100X. This happens to be a bacillus species. It is gram negative and it is a rod. So my gram status report would say, that this is a gram negative rod or a gram negative bacillus. This is a gram positive caucus. All right, take a look at this one. This is a picture of a smear under the 100X oil immersion lens. What are you going to write down on your report? What is the gram status of that organism? Go ahead and, and write it in the chat for me. Do look at the color. Look at the shape. Purple, gram positive. Pink, gram negative. Look at the color, look at the shape. And jot down in, in the chat for me what you're gonna say on your report for this, uh, this particular sample. What is the gram status of this bacterium? We are under the 100X or the oil immersion lens, a thousand X total magnification. Good, 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 good. Good, 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 good. Everybody got it. Gram positive caucus. Good job. Good job. Pretty basic, right? Pretty basic. Color, shape. Now, the other thing, just to put um, a fine point on it, a little frosting on the cake. Can you tell this physician anything about how these cells have arranged themselves? Do you see any arrangement on this slide? What do you think? Remember, by arrangement, we're generally talking about either chains, linear chains, or what we call clusters. Some people refer to them as grape-like clusters. Do you think that's happening here, or do you think it's all just pretty random? Um, you can see plenty of individual cells. Um, you can see maybe arrangements, but that none of them are really the same. What do you think? Does anybody think they see any arrangement on this slide? Yeah, there's definitely clusters on this slide. Now let me show you where they are, just in case you're not sure what you're seeing. Oops, hold on just a sec. Let me do that one more time. Mine's, my screen is looking a little wonky. Okay. So um, you can certainly see that something is clumping together here, right? Where it's very dark purple. You can see it down here. Just these dark clumps of cells. That's not so much what we're talking about. What we're talking about is more like this right here or this right below it. It looks like a little cluster of grapes. Here's another one right here that I'm drawing a circle around. 
Here's another one. Here's another one. It's groups of maybe 10 cells. Here's another one and another one. That's a nice one right there. It genuinely looks like a cluster of grapes. That's what you're seeing here. If you look around this slide, it's hard to find individual cells. There are a couple of them. There are a couple of individual cells. Here's one right here in between two clusters. But most of those cells have arranged themselves into little groups, little clusters. It's just a behavior that certain species of bacteria have that we see on smears. So you would also make a note for the physician that you think you see some clustering going on. And I can tell you that one of the very common gram-positive cocci that form clusters is Staphylococcus. Now, should you be able to look at that slide and know that it's Staphylococcus? No, you can't know that. You cannot look at that slide and say, oh, that's Staphylococcus, can't do it. You don't have enough information yet. You would have to do some more testing to know that you have a Staphylococcus. But in your mind, you should be thinking, huh, I wonder if this is a Staphylococcus. Because we know from years and years and years of microbiology that Staphylococcus has all of those features. It's a gram-positive coccus and it tends to form clusters. So you could not make that determination just by looking at that slide, but it would be on your short list of possibilities that this is a Staphylococcus. Okay. Take a look at this one. We are under the 100X lens, oil immersion lens. Tell me what, you, what you're gonna write down on your report. What is the gram status of these bacteria that I can see on this slide, this smear? What is the gram status? Is it gram positive or gram negative? And what is the shape of the cell? Good, good. Everybody's got it. The gram status, gram positive caucus. This is a gram positive caucus. I don't know its genus and its species, but I know that it's a gram positive organism and it's a caucus. It's got a spherical shape. I would also jot down on my report that I can see some arrangement here. That's not really um, something um, that I would ask you to do on an exam. I wouldn't ask you to tell me an arrangement on an exam because it is a little bit of an art to see them sometimes. But on this particular smear, you can really see that these organisms are chaining. They're chaining themselves. Let me go back and we'll take a look again. There's a couple things to note actually. The background of this slide is not white and clear and pretty and pristine. It's got this pinkish hue. And if you look very closely at the background, it's not an evenly stained background. This, it, this material came out of a patient. This is a body fluid. But I can definitely see purple cells and they are definitely cocci, okay? Remember, sometimes it's helpful when you're trying to determine shape to look for single cells or maybe two or three cells together. Here's the best thing I can see to help you determine shape. There's one, two, three, four cells in a chain and they are circular, they are spherical. You can also see two cells right here that are clearly cocci. Two cells here. Here's a short chain of maybe six. But these chains right here, this is what I'm talking about when I talk about chaining. 
long linear chains, head to tail. You can't make a, an identification from that slide. You cannot tell what that organism is just from a gram stain, but you have narrowed down the list of possibilities now because you know that whatever that bacterium is, it has, it has to be a bacterium that is gram positive, that is a caucus, and that likes to form chains. And I can tell you that Streptococcus does this. So other organisms are also gram positive cocci. Other organisms will also chain like this. But one of the big culprits is Streptococcus. Streptococcus loves to form those long chains. So we see a lot of strep in human medicine, especially in respiratory type uh, disease. And, um, and that is a real classic look for Streptococcus to be in those chains. All right. Now, take a look at these two images that are on your screen. I think when you look over here on the left, you can clearly see that this is a purple color. So automatically you're, you'll be thinking gram positive but it's not easy to tell the shape of these cells. I would go up to 100X. I would not make a call on the shape of these cells. Now you could look down in a place like this or a place like this and you might say, oh, I think those are cocci. Yeah, they might be cocci, but they're so small, hard to see at 40X. I would definitely go up to 100X on this particular smear. It's just too hard to see the shape. If you look at this one over here, it's a little bit easier to see that these are cocci, but I would go up to 100X. Look, you've got the 100X objective on your microscope. Use it, <laughs> use it. It just makes your job a little bit easier if you can really fully see what you're looking at. So an experienced technician might be able to look at cells like that under a 40X lens and go, oh yeah, those are cocci. But when we're first learning, it makes a lot of sense to go up to the 100X lens and really take a look at them. Notice too, the background of this smear versus the background of this smear. Both of these smears have been gram stained, but this, came from a pure culture. It happened to be a Staphylococcus organism. Staphylococcus epidermidis is the name of this microbe. This was made from a culture that was purposefully grown in the laboratory. Background is nice and clear. There's no debris on this smear. Compare that to this one. The background is staining heavily pink. Not only is it staining pink, but there are these big clumps of material in here. Super clumpy looking, debris ridden slide. In fact, if you looked at this slide, you can certainly see the purple cocci, the gram positive cocci, but it's very hard to tell if the pink is also an organism or if it's debris. It's super hard to see that on this slide. I would never ask you to tell me if there's one or two organisms on this slide because it's just too hard to tell. Patients samples, body fluid samples are harder to read. They just are. All right, how about this one? Gram status, please. We are under the 100X lens. Oh no, I take that back. I think we're under 40 for this one. Yeah, we are under the 40X lens. What do you, th what do you think? Gram positive, purple, rod, chains. Remember the arrangement is not part of gram status. Gram status is just 
gram positive or gram negative, and the shape. That's what you report as a gram status. Gram positive or gram negative and the shape of the cell. But we would then also add as a note, those are, um, these cells are forming chains. Now this is under a, a 40X lens. Look how big these cells are. Let me show you again. These cells are big. This is 40X. Remember, this is a 40X view. And this is a 40X view. These cells are huge. You don't need to go up to 100X to see that these are rods. This is that organism I told you about last time. This is that organism called Bacillus megatherium. It's just enormous. It's an enormous rod, easy to see at 40X. This is a, a smear, a gram stain smear at 40X. Same organism at 100X. See the difference? I can see that it's gram negative, but it's hard to see what shape it is. If I put it under the 100X lens, it's much easier. These are gram negative rods, gram negative rods. This happens to be E. coli. I wouldn't be able to know that though until I did further testing. Gram negative, pink, gram positive, purple. We're quickly running out of time this morning, but I do wanna talk for just a minute about limitations of gram staining. These, this is important information to know. Gram staining is wonderful. And it helps us a lot in our, in our journey of identification for uh, bacterial organisms. But there's a couple of things to know. Number one, gram staining is best accomplished with a fresh culture or a fresh specimen. What do I mean by fresh? Less than 24 hours old. When you have old bacterial cells, either in a laboratory culture or in a, sa a patient sample, the gram staining procedure is gonna give you inconsistent results, okay? It, the cells are not going to stain a nice, easily visible color for you. Remember too, that bacillus species and clostridium species can form spores. These two genera, of bacterial pathogens can sporulate. So that will start to happen in an old culture. It will start to sporulate. So old is greater than 24 hours for us. The other limitation to be aware of is this. Gram stains, like all stains, have an expiration date. So you should always check the date on a bottle of stain before you use it. If it's out of date, throw it away throw it away in hazardous waste and get rid of it. Old stains give inconsistent results. So let me show you uh, an example of this. On this slide that has been gram stained, you're, you might immediately say, oh, gram positive caucus. And boy, are these guys clustering, yeah? But take a look at this slide. Yeah, a lot of these cells are purple, purple cocci, but some of them are pink. Some of them are pink. They don't all have the same amount of purple stain associated with them. Some of them are pink. Now, if you looked at this and you told me, oh, there are two organisms on this slide, uh, there's a gram positive caucus and there's a gram negative caucus. I would absolutely forgive you for that because it looks like that, but there's only one organism on this slide. This uh, slide was made with a pure culture of one organism, but it's an old culture and the cells just aren't staining consistently purple like they should. The other thing to notice is because it's a pure culture, I would expect the background to be pristine. It is not pristine. I've got big globs of something that's staining black on this slide. I've got a big glob of something staining pink. 
that's that's bizarre. We don't expect to see that on a pure culture smear. This is an old culture. It's degrading. So don't use old cultures to determine gram status and don't use old stains. That's the message. Let me show you one more before I let you go. Look at this one. This is a little out of focus for us and I apologize for that, but it's such a good example of an old culture. I wanted to include it. Take a look at these cells. It almost looks like cocci that have joined together, doesn't it, in short chains? Look at that. That looks like four cocci that have joined together in a chain. This is a rod. This is a rod. And it happens to be a gram positive rod. This culture is old. And this rod, this bacillus species, has started to sporulate. Take a look at that cell right there. Purple at this end, purple at this end. It's got a big area in the white, in the middle that's white. That's a spore forming. Remember, spores do not take up stain. Notice that it's kind of bulging out too. This cell is right in the middle of sporulating. Here's another one that's sporulating right there. This is an old culture. You cannot determine gram status from this. You can't determine that these are gram positive rods. You're, when you look at a single cell like this one right here, part of it is purple. It's purple at each end, but it's pink in the middle. You've got individual cells that are staining both purple and pink. You cannot determine gram status from that. You would have to throw that away you would have to subculture, take some of those cells, put them in some fresh media, let them grow overnight, do your gram staining, okay? We cannot determine gram status when you see inconsistent staining like that. Mm -mm. If they are not clearly purple or clearly pink, you can't determine gram status. All right. So it's time for me to let you go. I'll leave you with this one. This is a patient sample. This happens to be a this happens to be a swab from the back of somebody's throat. Gram status. Gram positive shape. What's the shape? Cocci. Notice all that pink nasty debris back there? That's just mucus. That's mucus from the back of the throat. This is a strep. <laughs> this person has strep throat. Again, you can't tell that that's a strep just by looking at it. All you can tell is that it's a gram positive coccus and it likes to arrange itself in chains. All right, folks, great job today. I will see you on Wednesday and we will talk about aseptic technique. Okay, enjoy the rest of the day. Try to stay cool. See you next time. Thank you. You're welcome.